Hello, good afternoon. My name is Judith Mason and I would like to welcome you to today's webinar express COVID-19 impact on the promotion of place and the role of destination marketing organisations hosted by CIM Northwest. Before we get started, I'd just like to go over a few things so that you know how the event will work and how to participate. The presentation will last for approximately 30 to 35 minutes, followed by a short 10 minute Q&A session. You'll be able to post any questions you have by typing into the Ask a Question chat box in the Q&A panel, which you'll see on the right hand side of your screen. You can send in your questions at any time during the presentation and we'll attempt to answer as many as we can during the Q&A session at the end. If you want to share your thoughts on social media, we are using the hashtag CIM events. The webinar is being recorded and we will share a link to the recording with you over the next few days. You'll also be emailed a short feedback survey after the event, which we'd love you to complete. It'll only take a few minutes. All survey responses are anonymous, so please do let us know your thoughts. I'd now like to hand you over to Chris Brown from Marketing Liverpool, who is our guest speaker today. Over to you, Chris. Yes, good afternoon, everybody. Greetings from uh, from Liverpool. I hope you are all uh, safe and well and uh, delighted to have the opportunity today to give you a bit of an insight into all things Liverpool and uh, particularly the ever changing nature of uh, COVID and the pandemic. And it's probably it's probably reflective of the of the pandemic that we're in at the middle uh, of at the moment that uh, I could have probably changed this presentation three or four times. And indeed, if you uh, if you look at that uh, title slide there and you look at the huge volumes of people who were uh, came out into the city uh, less than a year ago now uh, to to welcome the giants back into the city, one, one finds it hard to imagine at the moment when such a scene will be replicated again in the future. Things that fundamentally make a city like Liverpool the exciting and vibrant place that it is that have had all those things removed. So maybe as we go through this presentation and I give you a bit of an insight, you'll be able to kind of reflect on that as well in terms of particularly the role that cities play in attracting such things. So just to kind of work out how we're going to go through this, just a bit about myself, then it would be wrong to talk about where we are without sort of having a look at Liverpool's re-emergence and positioning over the last uh, 25, 30 years or so and how that's affected the work that we do. And in, indeed, therefore, what, what COVID is bringing to us and whilst it's bringing a huge amount of challenges to us, there are also opportunities that come out of a crisis as well. And therefore, we should look at this uh, context in, as a half glass full per, uh, perspective, not, uh, not purely from a negative uh, half glass empty. So from my own perspective, You'll probably recognise from my accent that I am not a Scouser, I'm a kind of Scottish Scouser. Now, I'm uh, originally from Glasgow. Uh, my career primarily started in, in hotels. I was a graduate of the Scottish Hotel School at University of Strathclyde, uh, too many years ago to remember now, unfortunately. And then I moved into destination management here in Liverpool, actually, having come here initially as a hotelier back in the year uh, 2000. And um, at that time, uh, Liverpool, I, I will tell you, is a very different place and a very, uh, a very more challenging place than it is, is today. And then I left Liverpool in uh, 2004, just shortly after Capital Cultural announcement, and undertook a role at the uh, Cheshire and Warrington um, Tourism Board, which was interesting enough set up through through the halcyon days where we used to receive significant funding through the Northwest Development Agency. They remember the days of the RDAs, who provided massive strategic support for the for the tourism sector. And then I came back to Liverpool to start up. Uh, marketing Liverpool back in, in 2013 and uh, I've had a very enjoyable time promoting and, uh, and and sort of working with this great city of Liverpool and its wider wider city region. So that's what I'm going to that's what I'm going to cover. So if we just go back a little bit I mean I think what what we're in the middle of the moment is a sort of um, symptomatic really of, of, of Liverpool really it's a it's a city that is uh, you know got its charter uh, way back in 1207 so uh, we, we just celebrated its 813th birthday a week or so ago uh, and it's gone through a kind of a roller coaster of, uh, of highs and lows and successes and failures. Uh, and it's probably within the within the UK, I would say, a city that uh, has seen the highs of success and recognises the highs of, of failure and decline. And that was uh, no more than than that took place in the in the certainly in the 60s, 70s and early parts of the 80s. And it's just worth reminding ourselves what, what Liverpool did look like 30 years ago 
in, in, in terms of where it was at. You know, this was the Albert Dock in the late 80s, uh, a desolate place. This was the uh, the King's Dock waterfront back in uh, 2006, so only 14 years ago in, in terms of, it just gives a scale of really how fast uh, and how quick the regeneration and retransformation of the city has been <clears throat> over the last number over the last number of years, and if you put those two slides into context, uh, that is the 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 Albert Albert Dock today. Probably the Albert Dock, I would say, was the was where the renaissance of of Liverpool started. You know, uh, those who know Liverpool uh, know, will know it very well as being a very much of a, a red city. It's a it's a Labour heartland. Yet it was a it was a Tory. It was Michael Heseltine who fundamentally came to Liverpool, believed in Liverpool, saw a vision for Liverpool, and the manifestation of the Albert Dock was really the start of that. And uh, uh, Michael Heseltine is much revered in these in these parts and is uh, always warmly welcomed back into the city. And that King's Dock uh, photograph that I showed you now sort of forms a part of, of, of what we progressively talk about, a convention city with the uh, with the, the, the large scale arena at the forefront there, the uh, exhibition centre, the new exhibition centre at the back of the Pool Hotel built in, in 2016 and, and a transformed a transformed waterfront. And I think Liverpool as a city uh, recognised after, after many years of decline that the water, the waterfront and the water was one of its greatest and strongest assets. It turned its back on the water back in the 50s and 60s because the the port that had generated all those you know great uh, success stories for the city and made it uh, you know the second the, the 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 biggest port in the empire nearly it fundamentally had been the root of its failure and therefore people blamed the port they blamed the water that had brought success and therefore it took a long time to actually get back to recognizing that the waterfront and the water and the assets within that waterfront were actually the differentiating and distinctive assets that we needed to rebuild the city around because those are things that every city clamours for. What makes us different? What differentiates us? What makes us special? And, and the waterfront, I would suggest, in Liverpool is one, is one such component. But every city needs a seminal moment. It needs a moment where the tide turns, where your 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 views move from half glass empty to half glass full, where you have hope, where you believe that something is better ahead for you. And no two doubts about it that the turning point for this city was Liverpool 08, the capital of culture, the European capital of culture in 08, which was awarded to the city in 2003. The fact of getting European capital of culture per se was not so much about the event itself. It was the catalytic effect it had on the mood of the city, the catalytic effect it had on regeneration, where probably 20 years of regeneration took place between 2003 and 2008, and the mood of the people changed. So as I'll kind of highlight a few times during this presentation, taking the people of your city, taking the people of your place with you on the journey is absolutely imperative. And that Liverpool 08 was as much for the people of Liverpool as it was for the product of Liverpool. And indeed, actually, if you look back now to why was Liverpool successful, because when it bidded for capital of culture, it did it initially purely as a positioning statement. It had no real belief that it would actually win uh, Liverpool 08. In fact, Newcastle was by far and away the, the, the favourite for that. It was more about getting Liverpool back on the map again. But actually what won it and why the judges chose Liverpool was that they could see in the eyes of the people of Liverpool that they wanted it, they needed it, and they would do something with it. And I think that is as true then as to why when we won that as it is today. But that was the turning point for Liverpool without a fear of a doubt. But as everybody will ever know, when you win a major award or you have a World Cup or you have an Olympics or you have anything, then fundamentally it's what you do with the legacy of that event. You can run a great event as Liverpool did in 2008, but as we see many, many times, those events are sometimes then not followed through. There is no legacy. Stadia, things that were used to put on the major event go into basically into mothball. They're not used effectively enough. And I would have to say under the leadership here of the city, particularly the mayor, Joe Anderson here, 
he saw the value of culture very early on. He saw the value of major events and he saw them as differentiating factors that could position this city and re re reignite the passions of this city. And over that next 10 years up until 2018, he used major events and he used culture as a way of putting Liverpool on the map. And, and that is why Liverpool you know, has undertaken a, a major, major event transformation, fundamentally driven a great deal by its, by its visitor economy. But fundamentally, because that legacy was in place, because there was a, a very clear vision, then we were able to capitalise and build on 08 make sure that 08 was seen in the in the in the context of what we wanted to be as a turning point but not a finishing point and then i i use this slide primarily just to to demonstrate the changing the changing world we're in there there you'll see the the the, the you know the brilliant liverpool waterfront and uh, you'll then see the the cruise liner you know birthed in the in the middle of the mersey there but right in the middle of the city center and this year we would have welcomed 101 uh, cruise vessels to the city. We have ambitions to build a new cruise terminal over the next two or three years. And the impact of COVID was to completely wipe out the entire cruise season. So 101 planned and zero uh, turned up. That's a sort of, uh, you know, when you have a health pandemic, the, the implications of that are huge. And you know, 40 or so million written off our, written, written off our, uh, our accounts as a result of that. And Lack of clarity now, perhaps, about how the cruise industry will come back. But we still have the great ambition to, to go ahead and rebuild the, the cruise liner terminal in the new place that we wanted to do, combined with a new Isle of Man uh, steam, steam packet uh, terminal as well. So those, what I'm saying in that context is because we have a short term problem, because we have an issue that has been affected by a health pandemic, shouldn't take away your aspiration and your belief about what you really want to achieve with the place. And, and I have no doubt that Liverpool will go ahead and we will rebuild that, that, that cruise line, a terminal in, in the manner and the ambition that we wanted to do it. And we will probably welcome cruisers back. They may be differently, differently orchestrated, they may be differently managed, but the, 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 the sort of fundamental ambition will still be realised. And, and we have used the cultural context. And then here you see a picture of the Tate, which was one of the very, uh, first buildings that came into that Albert Dock, we have begun to use culture in a different way. And that is primarily to link it into the whole sense of place. So in many cities, in many places, and in many places I get involved in, in terms of who I look at and how they do their branding, how they do their positioning, it's quite often in a kind of silo way. So there's a kind of different model for investment and a different model for tourism and a different model for culture and a different model for sport. And actually what I think has happened over, over, the, over the number of years is that all these issues have become very much more blurred in the minds of the audiences that we're trying to achieve. So for us to try and create a city where talent is attracted to, whether that be to our, our high class universities or whether that be to work in our life sciences offer, it's not just about the quality of the life sciences job or where, where the office is or what the subject matter may well be. It's also about what happens when you walk out of that building at five o'clock. What, what do you move into? What, do you, what, what is your next set of experiences? We believe very, very much in the city that fundamentally connecting those experiences together, having a vibrant, exciting city that is culturally rich is also good to attract young talent retain talent because talent wants more things to do than just work. It wants to have a great work-life balance. It wants to have a great quality of life and culture, in our opinion, and the wider tourism economy and those things that make a city special all add into those things that make it attractive for a place to, to invest. And, and I don't know if you've ever, if you've ever, you know, some of you will, will know the, the Anglican Cathedral uh, in the city. I, I often say to people that the Anglican Cathedral for me is not only an absolutely magnificent building, but it's a probably symptomatic of one of the most entrepreneurial setups I've ever come across in the in that field of faith. This is a place where you can you can turn up at uh, seven o'clock in the morning for the purpose of that building, which is primarily faith. You can go to a dinner or a car launch. You can go as a, as to a concert. You can go where they've had hot air balloons in that business. 
and then return the next day at seven o'clock in the morning and it will be back to what it was as a place of faith. An absolutely shiny example of how a building can fundamentally be used for so many different purposes, but still stay rooted in the cores that it, uh, it was set up for. And uh, of course, you wouldn't expect me to do a presentation on Liverpool without um, talking about sport. And, uh, you know, here's uh, the kind of picture of, uh, of, of Liverpool here. And, uh, and, and of course, we, we, when I talk about Liverpool, I must talk about Everton as well. Uh, but when we were sitting down in January, we were planning a, uh, a parade at that stage for Liverpool, uh, hopefully winning the Premier League, which they ultimately went on to do. And we were planning that parade as being around attracting about a million and a half to the city. And we knew that that was conservative because the year before when Liverpool won the Champions League, we had a million people come to the city to for that for that particular parade. And uh, to think that those plans in January completely evaporated. And actually, when Liverpool did get around to winning the, the Premier League, it was uh, it was celebrated in an empty stadium with a, a couple of thousand who decided to go to Anfield on the night. But it was nowhere near the scale of ambition that we had that we had set. It was a you know a significant after 30 years since they won the league. It was a you know it was a, it was a great moment, but a, but a sad moment in many ways as well. But it demonstrates the actual power the power of sport in the, in that space. And you know if I if I then sort of now look at you know other events that we would you know celebrate you know this this particular one is of the of the entry the home of the the home of the Grand National you know the Grand National attracts you know a, a multi multi billion audience in terms of its people that watch that race it's a massive economic driver in the city it was obviously postponed this year because of COVID and even as we sit here today. Um, you know, we are not we are not confident at this stage that the Grand National could run in April next year uh, because of the of the uncertainty around uh, around the pandemic. The, the 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 ability for us to build as a city on those things that have made the city special, those things that are the real demand drivers of the city, the things we rely on every year, and that other cities rely on every year for their core product. All of that taken for granted, things that will always happen every year, things that are always in the calendar, all of that has been thrown into a completely different orbit. And we all have to now, I think, realise that, you know, these things we, that we take for granted, necessarily, we can't take for granted. We have, a, we have a similar conversation going on in the city at the moment about the return of people coming back to the offices, people back into a city centre again. And in a way, reminding people that if people don't come back into a city centre, then the things that made that city centre special, whether it was a corner shop, sandwich shop, whether it was a little restaurant or a little bar or a place that you used to go to after work, those things can't be taken for granted anymore in the context of what you may or may not come back to in, in the context of what you experienced when the city pre, pre-March and pre-COVID. And we already had, this is a, a picture of, uh, of Liverpool one. And, you know, when I, when I mentioned earlier on about the, the impact of, uh, of winning uh, Capital Culture in 2003, uh, you know, Grosvenor Estates built Liverpool one. They built it really cleverly at that time because they built it not as a mall, but as an open air, as an open air uh, uh, shopping uh, complex that fundamentally has done done well actually during since it reopened in in uh, in June after uh, after lockdown but also that was built in 5 years and uh, you could never imagine actually prior to that the liverpool would have had such a great offer but retail even before covid even before covid we were starting to talk about the future of retail the dynamics of retail the issues associated with online retail. Why would you go into a city centre anymore when you can buy it from the from the luxury of your of your armchair? And that uh, taken us around and, and is kind of emphatic about creating experiences, reasons why you should go to a place, how you animate a city, how you animate a city centre, how you animate a retail offer, both inside the retail offer and outside the retail offer. And we were beginning to do a number of different initiatives, and I'll talk about one of those in a minute or two around COVID, that actually gave you a reason to, to come to a place that wasn't just primary because you wanted to buy something, because you wanted to be immersed in that wider experience. And, you know, retail for us will 
continue to create challenges. We're seeing that across the country, but it's about how you adapt and how you amend and how you get a balance in a city between the high street brand. In this particular case, you're looking at Hugo Boss and you're looking at Harvey Nichols. But actually, in Liverpool, we've got an immensely strong, vibrant, independent community, uh, superbly managed by our by our by our bid teams, and 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 fundamentally, that gives you the differentiator between the real kind of Liverpool experience and the high street brand experience. And I believe that those independents will play an increasingly important role in this city as we go forward, because they are inherently connected passionate about the city and passionate to stay and develop their businesses in the city. And of course, uh, it would be also wrong for us not to to, to think about music. Uh, you, you'll all kind of recognise and understand, you know, the, the context of the Beatles and, and Liverpool. But, you know, Liverpool is very much a music city. The Beatles are inherently and continue and will always be a massive part of that music story. But they have generated off the back of the Beatles a huge music industry in this city, which at the moment, fundamentally in lockdown, you know, many, many uh, inspirational, innovative, creative musicians who have set up, developed businesses here and, and brought a whole vibrancy to this city are, are fundamentally unable to carry out their, 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 their work. We believe that they will come back to do that, but music uh, is a is an absolutely inherent part of our of our city offer, and uh, fundamentally we can't wait to welcome it back. And if you take um, the why I use this particular um, story of the of the Beatles story is that the Beatles story uh, great success in the city 80 85 percent of its business is international. Um, so fundamentally they they are a, they're a hub for our international visitors, um, and they now are. 80, 85% domestic, um, working off low capacities, to be to be very honest, in terms of what they can do. But it's a good sign of how a business has been able to, you know, adapt, change focus, think about a new market, look at how they can basically maximize the, the circumstances that they're in and create a different, a different offer. And yes, we would hope that they will get back to the the times that they, we wanted them to be in, which is fundamentally about driving uh, driving international traffic, but uh, shows that businesses can be flexible and can do different things. And although I've shown you this slide previously, this is more to reflect uh, the importance of business tourism to uh, to our city, business tourism and events. And uh, obviously, we we you know we await uh, further guidance uh, from government on the reopening of events, which was due obviously on the 1st of October, but uh, events, uh, exhibitions, concerts, these are all the things that fundamentally are so important for a city like Liverpool and for big cities and their absence and, and walking around as uh, I did yesterday around the, the complex and, um, and, and seeing it deserted is just so surreal. You know, we should just be on the verge now of welcoming the Labour Party to, to the city. Um, the, the Labour Party would bring conservatively 10 million pounds in economic benefit to our city. It would fill every hotel for miles around across the city and the city region. And at the time when the Labour Party should be here, we will be quiet and there will be nothing taking place in that in that in that centre. And we need to use and recognise and realise that these assets can't be taken for granted. They have to be basically we have to get through survival with them and then we have to rebuild and we need to rebuild by being you know, innovative and creative about the different types of events that will take place and recognizing that actually the, the, the whole context of, of, of developing hybrid using technology like we're using today in many ways can reach audiences of even larger proportion. So, you know, we, we know from uh, from some pilots that have run in other parts of the world that they've been able to attack, attract many, many thousands of delegates to fundamentally listen to a virtual conference than they'd ever would do on, on a physical conference. So there are opportunities in the hybrid model. It needs a bit more thought about, but to consider that we would just return back to what we had before, this is not going to happen. So we need to be geared up, we need to be ready, we need to be innovative, we need to make sure that we have the technology in place and the expertise in place to be able to fundamentally take this uh, take this forward for us. 
So when you look at our, our destination performance uh, as at, you know, what, what, you know where, we, where we were heading, and when, when you look at this, it, you have to take in context that the, the visitor economy for Liverpool, as I said earlier, has been the, the kind of cornerstone, the, the, the bit that have fundamentally has re-established the city and, and rebuilt the city. And, and it, up until 2019, um, the end of 2019, we'd had 10 years of continuous growth um, off the back of capital culture. We were, you know, going only in one direction at that time. And, and, and fundamentally, you know, that, that 4.93 billion that we generated in the city region, 3.3 of that coming out of Liverpool. Well, conservatively, um, for 2020, we're, we're looking at 35% of that. Uh, in terms of the of the impact of that, and that's not just an in, impact in economic terms. That's a massive impact at employment level, and and what what uh, what what Liverpool has sought to do is to rebuild an economy that encourages young people not just to go to university or go to college or go to school and then disappear as people did uh, many years ago, which is why you see many scousers around the world because. They were educated in Liverpool, but didn't stay in Liverpool because there was nothing really for them to do. Now, there is lots of things for them to do. And my worry in that, uh, in that area is about the loss of young talent, uh, particularly in the visitor economy sector. And where does that young talent go and how do we retain and give hope to that young talent going forward? So those are those are figures that we will be not be looking at with such, uh, you know, through growing spectacles uh, this time next year when we start to look at what the impact of 2020 has been. And what Liverpool has started to do, uh, and I've mentioned it a couple of times, is that it's it's begun to start to use that visitor economy over that 10 years. So when we celebrated Liverpool in 2018, 10 years on from 08, we didn't have that as a party to celebrate it 08. We had that as a marker for what the next 10 years was going to represent. What the period from 2018 to 2028 was going to look like. How was that going to be epitomised? And what we started to find is that by joining up the, that strong cultural visitor economy that made us so successful from 10 to 18, then fundamentally we've attracted the likes of the Royal College of Physicians who uh, are creating their northern base in Liverpool and will open in a year or so. And we now have around two billion pounds, even in COVID terms, there was still two billion pounds of of work undertaken going on in the city in terms of building around life sciences, around maritime, around automotive, around a whole bunch of sectors that fundamentally will build upon that great cultural offer that we have. So our, our future in that respect um, is very is very good and we, we anticipate that many of those schemes will still project their on site at the moment and they will still go forward. And uh, these are these are the kind of the, the reason why I showed the picture of the spine is that that really should be an epitome that will be one of the world's healthiest buildings in terms of sustainability and climate and all the factors that we were starting to look at are what makes a sustainable city, what, what makes a place that, that much different. Um, and, and of course, even when we got to 2019, this is just a, a stat on our, on our hotel performance. When we got towards 2019, we were starting to see some changes going on. And many of those changes we were starting to put down to Brexit. Uh, and it's hard to believe that we still got that uh, challenge to come around the corner uh, that would have dominated. Uh, if it hadn't been for COVID, then Brexit, I'm sure, would be dominating much of our conversation on what the impacts of that are going to be. And we started to see then that there were some, some, some challenges in the supply demand uh, equation. So that was the first year where we saw a little dip and, and a little marker of the things that are still to, to come around the corner. And of course, we also started to see prior to COVID that, that nothing was, um, was sacrosanct. Uh, you know, there's the Mexico Tourism Board that was basically demised. And then we also started to see, and this is very relevant to today, that um, if you take your residents for granted, if you don't take your residents on the journey with you, then fundamentally you're going to be in trouble. And we started to see that in Amsterdam, in Barcelona and other cities, that fundamentally not taking your residents with you uh, was fundamentally going to be a problem. Uh, Airbnb was another factor within that space that suddenly started to see that residents, you know, had, uh, you know, party nights staying next door to them. They couldn't get into their local restaurants and bars. 
because they were surrounded by tourists. So this mass tourism model, the mass tourism model, which was a, a high end of a debate in 2019, hard to think that we're talking about mass tourism now, but that was a factor at that time. And we were starting to think about that in Liverpool, about how we ensured that we got the balance right about attracting people, but making sure that our residents felt compelled to be basically, because they are the ambassadors of our city. And we have found through COVID that they have responded brilliantly to the challenges that, that the city has had. And then on our brand, very quickly on our brand, um, you know, our, our brand is uh, very important to us. This was the encapsulation of that brand for us. It was this, uh, this point that I've made a few times during this presentation about the challenge between voyage, tragedy, rebirth and the quest. And we are in that that latter box now around the whole quest and how we take the city, the city forward on that on that journey. And, uh, uh, you know, that quest now has become uh, markedly harder, but it will be underpinned by these values. And these are the values that take us that take us forward. And uh, they are inherently the same now as they, they, they will be post COVID. Nothing changes in that regard. They are still fundamentally aspects of life that fundamentally make Liverpool the place that it is, a place that will take challenge on, a place that is not scared to shout and make its voice heard. And it's also very much principled in the place about taking a stand and daring to dream. We all need to dare to dream swiftly now. Um, just, a, just, you know, one of the things that we started to see as a destination management organization is that you know what we say yeah it's it's critically important what we say but fundamentally it's not about what we say it's about what our our audiences say and this doesn't matter whether it's a visitor audience an investment audience a student audience the power of social media the power of digital tools and the ability for that to amplify or indeed send out negative messages about your place critically critically important so how we curate, how do you curate that market very, very differently is very, very difficult, I should say. But it's a fact that it actually means that every city now has to have authenticity at its heart. If you try to tell a story that isn't correct, and I you know through my early days in destination management, when, when before uh, the internet, you were able to say a lot of things about your, your destination, a lot of things that people would never really know whether they were true or not. Now you can't do that. So you have to be very authentic and very real and truthful about what you say, good, bad, or indifferent. And uh, painting a rosy picture about everything is not the track to go down. I won't dwell on this too much, but what it really builds on is that what we are targeting all our work around now is about those audiences and getting a message to those demographics in the language that they will understand about the things that they are interested in. So segmenting those audiences in terms of their likes and then maybe packaging up the things in our city that we know they will be interested in. So not saying come to Liverpool is great on everything. It's basically fundamentally about, you know, making sure that we fundamentally get the message out to the audience in the language that they understand through the medium that they understand. And these are these are characters that I put up here, uh, you know, from Glasgow, my, my own home city, Norwich and London. These are real people. So in the past, sometimes we've used actors, we've used others to bring our promotional life, to, you know, to, 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 to our promotional ideas to life. Now we don't do any of that. We will only ever now use, rough, you know, real people to tell real stories about real experiences. And sometimes you have to take that in the context and sometimes it's a bit more rough and ready. Sometimes it's not finely polished as you would get through a production. And sometimes it tells you a few things that you don't want to hear. But fundamentally, it's authentic, it's real, it's believable. And that I think is so important and so much more important now as, as we go forward. So I'm coming towards the end of this now and I'm just going to pick up on a, on a, on a, on a few things around, uh, you know, a, a few things around that we need to kind of think about and reflect about as we go forward particularly this, this battle around, uh, there isn't a battle in my mind, it's not a battle in the true sense, but it, it is around survival versus growth, making sure that as much of our businesses survive uh, as we possibly can in order to allow them to be able to grow going forward. Managing the, the health challenges and the economic challenges is immensely difficult. And I've no doubt that in Liverpool, as it isn't going to be in a lot of cities, that challenge is right in front of us. 
But actually, the national and local leadership factor, I think we've had great local leadership. I'm not too sure we've had great national leadership. But one of those things out of local, local leadership is that we've had fast decision making. We've had things that have been happening. We were able to pedestrianise areas in our bid areas, you know, streets in our bid areas we've been talking about for years about pedestrianising. We were able to do it very, very quickly because the crisis demanded it. So we created this concept called Liverpool Without Walls, giving businesses the opportunity, particularly in the hospitality sector, to expand onto the streets. We gave out 230 pavement licences inside two weeks, whereas normally we give out six a year. So fundamentally, we were able to work at speed, and that's because of great local cooperation between the private and public sector. And I think that's going to have a significant impact. We, as a destination management organisation, massive impact on us. Our commercial and demand drivers evaporated overnight. We've had to do a whole pile of different things. But it's maybe reminded people that actually destination organisations like ours are not just about marketing campaigns. They're not just about that. There's lots of other things that we, we get involved in. And that without walls is an example is uh, this was uh, the picture we took in the in the in the August time of of Castle Street, one of a, a busy street in the city centre. Uh, and fundamentally, you can start to see what the impact of that outdoor dining, Euro European style that fundamentally, if we're taking this picture the year before, that's not the picture you would have seen. It'd been a much more about much more indoor and not enough outdoor. So these are things that will come and be part of our reimagining of, of our city as we as we go forward. And then those changing future influences as we go forward. I've mentioned a few times about the importance of residents. We had a long conversation uh, when I did this uh, presentation in the Isle of Man earlier in the year about the importance of cities and towns and that towns necessarily felt left out because of the importance that was seen to be given to cities. And now actually through COVID, towns have actually done better as people have stayed local, realise what they have uh, on their local doorstep. And actually the challenges move back to cities about how cities are going to reinvigorate themselves. And as part of that, we will have to show great vision. I do not strongly believe this is the time for long drawn out strategies. This is vision and action, not strategy. And it will be driven by inspiration, creativity and innovation. And we have bucket loads of that here in our, in our, in our city. And to recognise that if we just think that actually in time, and hopefully this pandemic goes away, we'll just go back to the old demand drivers that always made our things, our football, our Beatles industry, our music industry, our events, all those things will just come back and life will go back to normal. We will be making a very big mistake. We have to use this opportunity to look at all of the facets that make a city special and create new reasons to come to our city, not just rely on old things coming back as, as they were. And just in terms of, of finishing here, um, and this is my, my, my last slide, I would implore on government and others to think about the medium to long term. Um, short term initiatives like Eat Out to Help Out were great, but what does Eat Out to Help Out, what's the replication of that in the autumn and winter months where we have a, another set of challenges? We need, we need a different review. We need government to understand that for us as a destination management organisation and marketing is a key part of that, but it's not our only function where there is a much more wider and a much more wider need to understand what we do and how we do it and what the impact of that work that we do is on the public and private sector. And I think building what I said earlier, our public and private sector have worked immensely well together over there's been new relationships forged new things forged together that I think will make massive differences to how people undertake roles and responsibilities going forward. And we must make sure that as we do that, that COVID uh, is not something that we then just go back to the way we used to do it. We need to learn from what we've learned through this crisis, build on it and build a better city, and take this city forward with the same ambition and the same pride and passion that I had post COVID. And I've no doubt that we will be able to do that. So I hope that fly through of Liverpool, I could talk about it for another hour or so, to be honest, has given you some insight into what we're doing, how we're changing, how we're reimagining, but how we still retain the same ambition and pride in this city than we did even before COVID started. Great, many thanks, Chris. Uh, we're now going to have a short 10 minute Q&A session. As a reminder, you can still submit your questions via the chat box in the Q&A panel.
And the first question um, for Chris is from Joe, wondering how easy it was to get all of the different parties that you've mentioned, investment, life sciences, education, tourism, etc., all working together and aligned in their activity to promote the city. How was this achieved and does it still happen? It's a, well, what I would say is that it's a, it's a never, it's never, it's never done. It's never done and dusted. It's an evolving um, scenario. You need good leaders in that space who see the bigger picture. Uh, we're quite fortuitous. We have a number of those in the city. Uh, it's it's a kind of collaboration of, of principle. There's a great collaboration in this city, but fundamentally we will have to continue that journey. And it's more challenging now, I would have to say, as we start to look at what the city looks like um, going forward. Um, but I've absolutely no doubt that what COVID has done in many ways is laid the whole ecosystem very bare and it's laid out very clearly how everybody relies on everybody else. So whether you're in the tourism economy, you rely on the theatres, you rely on the convention centres, you rely on retailers, you rely on football and other sub actors. If you're running a local cafe in the middle of our commercial district, you rely on the offices who basically people that go to that office and come back out and use your premise. So actually, if there's ever, ever a, a rationale for making sure that we have a joined up approach and that everybody recognises and realises the challenge each of us face, now is that time. We started that journey. We must continue it and continue it with the same degree of passion and uh, belief that we had prior to COVID coming. And then we've got a question from Steve um, from Swansea City Council. Um, do you have an agreement with your private sector partners to provide you with the data that you need to report on performance? Ah, it's a very good point. It's a very good point, data and intelligence. I would say that what uh, what what we we be, we've certainly been looking at, and, and we've been working with colleagues in the in the in, in Liverpool one and the, and the bid, and with private sector partners, uh, and the council and the combined authority about how we develop a much more informed uh, approach to what we want to do, primarily by using uh, intelligence and data better. And uh, we, we started to put a few uh, pilots in place for that to begin to measure, you know, particularly using mobile phone technology and uh, credit card technology to be able to work out, you know, who's coming from where, what are they spending, how's their dwell time. We've got a lot more work to do in that. And I would say, you know, to, to, to Stephen Swansea that, you know, we've got a lot, a lot of work to do in that space. It's really, uh, I think it's, it's sort of shown how important it is and that actually data and intelligence is going to be a critical factor. We knew it was going to be, we know, always know it's important, but the raw, the raw data of a hotel has 80% occupancy is really absolutely no use to us. It's who's made up that 80%. A business basically is, a, is attracting 100 staff. Where are they coming from? Where, why have they come? What are they doing? So there's a, there's a journey and a half there on intelligence and it's absolutely going to be critical for cities uh, and for any business, I would suggest, to basically put more resource and thought processes into developing and creating high quality data and intelligence. Um, I've got a question next from Helen. Has Liverpool implemented any promotional changes to encourage people or office workers back into the city once lockdown measures were decreased? Yes, well, we, um, uh, which I should have mentioned in my presentation, actually, when we, um, when we, when we had the uh, initially the the reopening of the retail economy in June and then the, the hospitality sector in July. We ran that concurrently with a campaign called Love Your Liverpool. Um, and uh, the, the principles of, of Love Your Liverpool had a very strong safety message alongside them. So it was about being being responsible, being, you know, being being sort of, you know, kind to people, but also fundamentally about inspiring our residents because actually, as it will be for the next six, seven, maybe a bit longer months, we will rely very heavily on our domestic audience and we needed our residents to come out and show their passion into the city, uh, which they've done in, in, in spades. Uh, but we need to we need to build on that and we need to you know, make sure that we continue that going forward. So a lot of our, our thinking has changed a bit and it's a bit like when I, I made the allusion to Amsterdam and Barcelona, <coughs> who necessarily cities that are, you know, brilliant cities, but maybe put their economy ahead of their social values, that this whole essence of inclusive growth about ensuring. So that knowledge economy building I showed you about the spine, 100 metres away from there is one of the most deprived communities 
in, in, in England. Uh, and we have to find ways of making sure that those communities feel that such a building like that spine is going to bring benefit to them. And that needs really, you know, clever, clever thinking about how you make these things happen. So we found very much that, uh, you know, making sure that our residents are with us, that they're supportive of us is, is really important. And clearly that they feel that the city is a safe city because that amplifies our message. So we will continue to work very much uh, as we have done uh, on that campaign and to develop that. But we will we will be very cognizant now of the importance of our residents. If we ever were, if we ever needed reminded about ensuring that they're on that journey and they're connected to our journey as we go forward. Um, I've got a question from Jane. How do you think other cities in the UK are coping? Some good, some bad. Has COVID brought them together? Well, I think it's very difficult because every every city is in a different space. And, and uh, you know, if I look at our, 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 our friends in, in, in Manchester, uh, Manchester has probably been slightly hit harder than Liverpool in many ways because uh, because of the airport, because it's a very much more of a business city than, than we are. And uh, they've got large corporate areas and, and that's affected their dynamics. We have low, lower levels of corporate business here in terms of you know, national and international chains. We have a lot of independent businesses here. That has meant that our footfall during the periods of July and August has been quite strong. So each city has a different dynamic. Um, I think all cities have recognised that they, they, you know, the importance for them is about collaboration. It's about sharing experiences. And I think in the north, we, we actually have a very good sharing culture with, uh, with our cities, our comparative cities, the days of us competing with the likes of Manchester uh, are really gone. I mean, we'll always compete with them on the football pitch, by the way, but not so much necessarily in, in terms of business or attracting. We work very closely with them, as we do with Leeds and Newcastle and Hull and York and other cities across the north. So I think every city has its own its own, uh, its own own position and its own challenges. Uh, and, and many, you know, will we'll have to, we'll, we'll deal with those in the way they do. But I would think that this will definitely drive up a, a new spirit of collaboration both internally and externally within your city and I've certainly seen that in Liverpool and Spades and it's been great to see in our city that those public and private sector all come together with a common cause which you know sometimes hasn't happened in the past. All right, thanks and I think we've got time for one more question. Has the Covid pandemic set back the ambitions that the city has and are planned projects now likely to be cancelled? Um, definitely not. Uh, I mean I think we, we see this as definitely a uh, a, a period where we where clearly our aspirations have been delayed and uh, they have been uh, they've been challenged but that doesn't take away from our vision about what we want to achieve with the city it doesn't take our ambition away it mainly mean you know purely delays the 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 the, the, the transformation of that into action um, and it would be very important I think that we send that message very loud and clear to our residents, to our businesses, and to those who are interested in doing business with this city, that we remain open for business, we remain open to attract business, and we remain ambitious. Once you start taking away those pillars of ambition and aspiration and, and start to feel that you're in, going back into a period of decline and we're all doomed, then, then fundamentally I think you're on the, the wrong side of the curve. And we have to we have to accept the difficulties we're in, but we we we, we most definitely do not. Uh, displace that vision and ambition we have. Excellent. Thank you very much, Chris. That's all the time we have now for our Q&A session today. I'd like to say thank you to Chris for today's presentation, CIM Northwest for organising the event, and a thank you to you all for attending. We hope you found it interesting and worthwhile. Our next webinar express will be Leading and Managing Through Change on Monday the 21st of September at 1pm, hosted by CIM Yorkshire. You'll find it listed on the events page on the CIM website where you can find out more information and register for the session. Once again, you'll shortly be receiving a survey on today's event and we really appreciate it if you could provide your feedback. So on behalf of CIM, thank you for joining us and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day.